Uh, welcome, parents, uh, guardians, and community members. Thanks for coming to out to the Commodore meeting or Commodore building this evening. I'm Jeff Pellerito. I'm the assistant director of special education at Perrysburg Schools uh, for our junior high and high school. We're very excited to have um, Dr. Peg Dawson um, working with our teachers tomorrow as part of our Diverse Learners Day. Um, we welcome you to the Commodore building and thank you for attending tonight's uh, presentation, Smart But Scattered, Helping Children Strengthen Executive Skills to Reach Their Full Potential. Um, Dr. Dawson will introduce herself and her work in just a moment. Uh, before we get started, a few safety reminders for our staff, family members, students, and guests who are present. Please note uh, there are exits on both the east and west sides of the room. Um, outside of the door to the right, you will find an AED. Also, um, we are located at 140 East Indiana Avenue, and thank you for joining us this evening. Dr. Dawson, I'll see you. Thanks, I'm delighted to be here, and I changed the title after I sent in the description. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. I did this for a group in uh, oh, Colorado, I think, last month, and they, they suggested the title. I thought, That's interesting, I like that. It's a bit of an exaggeration. I don't think you can actually improve executive skills without frustration, <laughs> um, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, so let me introduce myself. My, I am a school psychologist by training, so I worked in the public schools for about 16 years before moving into a clinic setting where I focused on assessing kids and adults with learning and attention disorders, so that's my background. And my interest in executive skills came about um, in that setting because I was testing a lot of kids referred for possible attention problems. And I pretty quickly realized, uh, as I worked with those kids more extensively, that the American Psychiatric Association's diagnostic criteria for ADHD, which is problems with attention or problems with hyperactivity, impulsivity, or both, really didn't begin to describe the problems I saw these kids having. I saw huge problems with time management and planning and organization and those kinds of skills. And I remember talking with my colleague, uh, Dr. Guerr, about it at the time. He's also the co-author of all the books I've written. Um, he and I both did our doctoral work at the University of Virginia, although we were there at different times. But he went on to do a postdoc in neuropsychology at Children's Hospital in Boston. So as I was describing these issues, he said, well, Peg, those are executive skills. Well, this was the late 80s, early 90s, and people were not using that term much in those days. So he and I decided we really wanted to understand these skills better. What are they? How do they develop? What's going on in the brain? How do they impact school performance? And most importantly, how do you help kids with weak executive skills become more successful students? So that's what led to our writing. We wrote a book for professionals first called Executive Skills in Children and Adolescents, and then we realized there was a huge role for parents in all of this, so that's what led us to write Smart But Scattered, and then Smart But Scattered Teens. We have several books in that series. Um, at the same time I was doing all of this professionally, I should also mention I was raising two kids of my own. I have two sons who are now well into adulthood, I'm actually a grandmother. Um, my older son at the age of 14 was diagnosed with an attention disorder. Uh, and so I actually feel like a lot of what I learned about executive skills, particularly on the intervention side, the what do you do about it side, came as much from my experience as a mom as my experience as a psychologist. Uh, and the nice thing about being a mom of one of these kids is you get the longitudinal perspective. You get to see what they look like when they grow up. <laughs> um, and my message to parents all the time is most of these kids turn out fine. <laughs> and I can almost see the audience relax at that point because if you're in the early stages of dealing with one of these kids, it may look pretty daunting. Um, you don't know what the future is going to bring, but you know what? Kids grow up, they mature, their brains mature, and if you use the strategies which I'll describe briefly tonight, but which are described in much more detail in our books, these kids really do have a good shot at success. Um, and that's why I enjoy working with them. Um, <laughs> and a, a couple of weeks ago, I found an a cartoon in The New Yorker that really, really made me think back to my parenting days. And at one point when I think my older son was in sixth grade and my younger son was in fourth grade, um, I was president of the National Association of School Psychologists. I was doing a lot of traveling around the country. And I remember thinking at the time, hmm, I wonder if this is really bad for my kids, you know, that I'm not home un as much as I should be, <laughs> and just say, hmm, I wonder what it's going to look like. <laughs> so this cartoon sort of really captured uh, my experience at the time. It's a woman on the phone, and she says, hey, looks like I'm going to be stuck here a while. Can you get dinner started and finish raising the kids? 
<laughs> which I think is how my husband must have felt at times during that year. So I shared this cartoon with my two sons, and my older one, the one with the attention disorder, who has this sort of wry sense of humor, sent back this comment. He said, ha, well, we found stability on the margins. <laughs> So that was my son's reaction to that. So without his introduction, um, I'm going to talk for about an hour and 15 minutes, and then maybe a little less, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. This is being recorded. We're going to make it available for people who couldn't come tonight. Um, but at the point where we open it up for Q&A, we'll turn off the recording, um, because I want people to feel comfortable asking a question or making a comment or raising an argument um, without feeling like you're being recorded for posterity. So that's the sort of general, general structure here. So let's think about what executive skills are. Um, they are brain-based skills. They're managed out of the frontal lobes of the brain, which is the part of the brain right behind the forehead. And they take a minimum of 25 years to reach full maturation. OK, brain-based skills take 25 years to mature. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about where your kids are along that, that developmental timeline. Um, why do we call them executive skills? They're the skills required to execute tasks. Um, although my favorite definition for them, which was, I teach a class at the University of Southern Maine every summer, and I had a, a second grade teacher who was trying to figure out, how do I explain executive skills to second graders? And what she came up with was, they're the skills you need to get things done, which is great. I think that really captures it, because here are those skills. Um, we end up, I mean, every, everybody who studies executive skills has a different way of thinking about them, defining them, categorizing them, et cetera. This is the model we came up with. I sometimes call it the smart but scattered model. Um, and so we decided to focus on 11 skills which we thought were the most critical for school success. Um, and in recent years, I've started dividing them into two groups, foundational skills and advanced skills. Um, the foundational skills are the ones that develop first. Um, and I listed them in roughly the order in which we think they develop, um, starting from shortly after birth. It's, I mean, a lot of these are developing simultaneously, and no one's created a timeline to say what, what comes first, second, third, et cetera, but that's my best guess. Um, and many of those, if not all of them, you can see the early signs of them in the first year of life, and I notice we have an infant in the first year of life here. How old is your? Six weeks. Six weeks, oh, okay. So you're not seeing anything yet, but you will soon. <laughs> um, so yeah, they, they develop, they begin to emerge in the first year of life. They look a little different than how we think of them when school age kids, but nonetheless, you can see the early signs. Um, the advanced skills, the order in which I've listed those is a little more arbitrary. Uh, except for metacognition, we think metacognition is the last executive skill to emerge in any kind of sophisticated form. Um, and of all the skills that are listed up there, that's the one that confuses people the most. You could probably come up with your own definition for almost all the other skills there, but metacognition is, is a little more abstract. Um, the throwaway definition for metacognition is it's thinking about thinking, which I'm not even sure what that means. So let me share my definition for you. Um, and I, I have to say, once metacognition kicks in, the brain changes dramatically. And it's not overnight, because metacognition develops slowly. But you, a, 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 a brain with fully developed metacognitive skills looks very different from a brain without fully developed metacognitive skills. So here's my definition. Metacognition is the awareness that you have thoughts and that you can use those thoughts to understand the world, solve problems, make sense out of things. So obviously kids have thoughts from a very early age. You know, as soon as they acquire language, all their thinking is out loud. Um, but as they get more skilled at language, it tends to go underground. We call it internalized speech. So after a while, uh, when we, we see a young child, we have to wonder what they're thinking. Whereas when they first start talking, they're sharing most of their thoughts with us. So in, kids have thoughts from a very early age. What they don't have at an early age is awareness that they can use those thoughts as tools. Once they have that, then you'll see a bump in all those other advanced skills because now they can use their thoughts to plan and prioritize, to create organizational systems, to learn how to manage their time, and to set goals. Um, now, when I am talking with parents or teachers of elementary age kids, my general advice to them is focus on the foundational skills. 
Those are the first skills to develop. And if you put interventions in place to address those skills in elementary school and keep them in place long enough, which is actually pretty key because a lot of us tend to stop using interventions before they work, you will see progress across elementary school. Even with some of the more challenging ones, I think about kids who struggle with a response inhibition or emotional control, you will see progress if you keep those skills, those strategies in place long enough. Um, it's not that you ignore the advanced skills. You can certainly model them, talk about them, walk kids through the process. We just don't expect kids to be independent with those advanced skills by the time they leave elementary school. Now, when I'm talking with parents or teachers of middle school kids, what I say to them is if you expect kids by middle school to be proficient in those advanced skills, you must be pretty frustrated because those skills for most kids are just emerging at the middle school level. And what we know about emerging skills is they look great one day and lousy the next. I mean, think about learning to ride a bike. You don't go from not being able to ride a bicycle at all to being able to ride three miles fluidly without falling off. No, there's a lot of falling down that goes on between those two points in time, and some practice sessions look better than others. Even into freshman and sophomore years in high school, many kids are still feeling their way with those advanced skills. And I am talking about typically developing kids here, because although we got interested in executive skills by working with kids with ADHD, once we realized these skills take 25 years to reach full maturation, we realized that every kid has immature executive skills. Um, and it's something that both parents and teachers should be aware of, what's developmentally appropriate at different ages. The other piece of advice I give is if, if you have a child of any age who has significant executive skill challenges, focus on the foundational skills because they're the first skills to develop and they're the building blocks for the later skills. Okay. Now, just to, to back up my, my claim that these skills take a long time to reach full maturation, um, the picture's worth a thousand words. So I'm going to show you a series of MRI scans that shows the brain changing between the age of 4 and 21. It was, they were all taken by a neuroscientist at UCLA named Paul Thompson. Um, he brought the same kids in year after year, starting at age 4, took an MRI scan of their brain. It's the way you, one way you can take a picture of the brain. Um, and sent them home, brought them back a year later, and then he created this composite. So I'm going to bring you pretty quickly between age 4 and age 21, and I want you to see how late in the process um, the frontal lobes mature. So there are a couple things you need to understand. Let's see if my, yeah, it only works here. I have a, I have a laser pointer here. Um, a couple things to understand these, these images. First of all, the color. You know, an immature brain is red and orange. A mature brain is blue and purple. So you can see at age four, there's nothing that's purple. What's blue is mostly related to sensory processes like vision and touch, because it's the sensory systems that are the first ones to develop in the brain. Now, the other thing is, where's the frontal lobe? And I recommend you watch the right-hand image here, because it's clear it's a top-down image. Um, and so the frontal lobe, it, it, which is sometimes called the prefrontal cortex as well. It's at the top of this, um, this brain image. Um, and you can see by looking at that pretty clearly that at age four, the frontal lobes are the least mature part of the brain. Because look, it's mo there's a lot of red and orange there, whereas not as much in the rest of the brain. So I'm going to bring you pretty quickly to age 21, and I want you to see how late in the process this part of the brain, the top of that right-hand image, turns blue. It does not turn purple because, unfortunately, Thompson stopped at age 21, and these skills take at least 25 years to mature. Okay, so here goes. Let's see if we can do this. Yep, there we go. Okay, so there we are at age 21. There's a fair amount of purple there, but not in the frontal lobes. In fact, there's still a significant amount of green there, and the text there says the 21-year-old brain is mostly mature, but the areas of green show that even at the threshold of legal adulthood, there is still room for increases in emotional maturity and decision-making skills, which will come in the next few years. Now, I'm going to bring you back to age 13, because that's middle school. Um, let's see if I can do that. Yep, I can. Here goes. 
Okay. This is what the middle school brain looks like. It is mostly green. There's a lot less red and orange than there was at age four, so progress has been made. But when I look at the blue there in that image, I'm not seeing a whole lot more blue than I saw at age four. Think of what we ask middle school kids to keep track of, remember, organize, plan for. As soon as they start changing classes, every teacher has a different set of expectations about how homework is to be done, how projects are to be completed, how tests are to be taken, how notebooks are to be kept. Many schools use block scheduling, and kids have A days and B days they have to keep track of. Many use rotating schedules, so first period on Monday, a second period on Tuesday. I've worked at several schools in the past few years that had seven-day rotating schedules. So first period on Monday changed from week to week. These kids often have complicated after-school schedules, and many of them are living in two homes. And we get mad because they forget something. We are asking them to juggle a lot of information. Um, so with that as introduction, I'm, what I'm going to share with you next is my, actually, let me just move to it. It's my take on the perfect intervention for executive skills. It's not a perfect intervention. It's a rule for one, though. Um, and even there, I'm probably exaggerating. But from uh, the examples I'm going to give you from here on out, many of them fall into my rule for a perfect intervention. So here it is. The perfect intervention to support executive skill development is one that takes no more than five or ten minutes a day and that you're willing to do forever, or as long as it takes. Now, I can almost guarantee you it won't take forever, because if you keep these, the, these practices in place, kids will internalize whatever the routines, the habits, whatever you're trying to teach them, they will internalize them. But I can also pretty much guarantee it'll take longer than you think it should, in part because the brains are still developing. Okay, so sort of keep that in mind. I'm gonna go through them skill by skill now. I'll just sort of highlight, here's what we think about as a strategy for each skill. I'm only gonna throw one at you, um, but it's the one I think, well, this is the place to start. So let's start with response inhibition. There are a lot of different names for this. You know, sometimes we call it impulse control, self-control, um, self-regulation we sometimes call it, although that has an emotional aspect to it too. Um, sometimes we call it the ability to delay gratification, the ability to wait to get a reward. Um, it emerges around six months of age. It's pretty rudimentary at that point because what an infant at that age has available to them is respond, don't respond. It will look different in a three-year-old, different in a 13-year-old. And as kids acquire language, they use language to support response inhibition. So if you hear a, t a toddler saying to herself, no, don't do that, because she's heard a parent say that to her. She's using language to inhibit a response. Um, so some experts on executive skills maintain that this is the most critical skill. If you don't get response inhibition, how are you going to get something like planning or time management? So the strategy we focus on for response inhibition is we teach wait and stop. If you can get wait and stop into kids, that's basically response inhibition. And there are some very natural ways that parents of young children do this. I'll just give you one example, but I collect these stories. But this is from my own personal experience. Um, my, and this goes way back to my childhood. My mother lived and died by a kitchen timer. I mean, she used it for everything. You know, if we were dawdling over dinner, I'd remember she'd set the timer and challenge us to finish dinner by the time the bell rang. Um, when I was practicing the piano, I was setting the timer for practice sessions. But I can remember being made to take a nap at an age where I didn't think I needed to take a nap anymore. <laughs> now, looking back on it, I think I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on Cape Cod. My father was an oceanographer. He was out to sea for six months out of every year. I had three brothers. We were all close in age. And so, yeah, I don't think I needed to take a nap. I think my mother needed time to herself. And this was her way to get it. So, but I can remember lying down on the bed, and sometimes she'd let me lie down on her bed. She would set a kitchen timer, and she would say, you can get up when the bell rings. What was she doing? She was teaching me to wait. You know, it takes... You have two seconds to set a timer. So, but you do that day in and day out, across childhood, in a wide variety of situations, kids learn to wait. Um, and that's basically response inhibition. 
They're also, if you think about it, there are childhood games that have been around for generations, if not centuries, that do the same thing, right? Think about Simon Says or Red Light, Green Light. Or we had a game when I was growing up called Mother May I. I always find it interesting that some people nod at that because I thought, oh, boy, that's an obscure game. I don't think my kids would know what it is. Um, but we do remember it. All those games require the kids playing them to listen to the instructions, process the meaning of those instructions, and make a decision. Am I going to act? Am I going to stop? Am I going to wait? OK, let's go on to the next executive skill, which is working memory. So there are a lot of different memories. I've, I've been sort of reading about memory lately, and you can get totally lost in the weeds when you, when you look at different kinds of memory. But I really like working memory. I love the name because that's exactly what it is. It's not just being able to remember something. It's being able to work with what you remember. So for instance, if I want to stress this out in a testing situation, these, the easiest way to do that is ask kids to solve a multi-step math problem in their head. You know, give it to them orally, ask them to solve it in their head. So question off a standard cognitive test is eight birds are on the ground, four birds fly away, two other birds land. How many birds are on the ground now? If I ask a child that question and they, give me, they do the first step and give me that as their answer, I'm thinking, hmm, what's going on with working memory? Have they forgotten what the question is asking? Have they forgotten what step they're on? That question also asks kids to hold on to the precise numbers in the question and to pull from long-term memory, which is where it's stored over time, into working memory two math procedures, addition and subtraction. So there's a huge working memory load to that one question. There is nothing we ask kids to do that doesn't require working memory. Um, just sending them to their bedroom to retrieve a sweatshirt. They still have to remember why they're there when they get there. Okay? so. Um, and by the way, I've done work in schools for kids with dyslexia and more complex learning disabilities, and what those teachers tell me is that working memory is the weakest skill for that population of kids. So if you have a child with dyslexia or a learning disability, sort of keep that in mind. Um, and I'm fairly firmly convinced that um, there aren't ways necessarily to strengthen working memory in kids with weak working memory. So that means we're going to have to teach them workarounds for that. Um, and one of the things we focus, these, these kids are going to need cues, prompts, and reminders for far longer than we think we should have to give them. Uh, and so one of the strategies I, I talk about a lot is pairing verbal with visual. Never rely just on verbal instructions to the maximum extent that you can. Giving kids checklists, putting a post-it by the door if there's something they have to remember to do before they leave, <clears throat> sending kids, older kids texts, you know, whatever it is. If you have both a verbal and a visual, that increases the likelihood they're gonna remember what it is they need to remember. Okay, uh, moving on to emotional control, which is the ability to manage emotions. Um, this may be the most complicated skill I mean, the brain is hardwired for these skills to develop, but with emotional control, it's actually a pretty complex dance between the internal hardwiring of the brain and the environment in which the infant finds itself. So an infant who's in the best position to develop good emotional control is one who by seven months of age at the latest has a consistent, reliable caregiver who responds to his or her physical and emotional needs in an appropriate and timely fashion. And there's one additional ingredient, that caregiver is able to manage their own emotions well. Because there's a mirroring process that goes on here. Infants learn to manage their emotions by watching how those around them manage theirs. In fact, we call them mirror neurons. Um, and one of the things I've done some thinking about, I've done a lot of thinking about what's happened to executive skills over the course of the pandemic. And one of the things that occurs to me is that when people are stressed out, they have trouble managing their emotions. And it's not just kids. Kids' parents are stressed out as well. So when we see kids struggling with their emotions and, and maybe seeing this sort of dysregulation, maybe it's they've got parents at home that are dealing with stress and that's what they're seeing, that their parents, the emotions are overflowing with their parents as well. Now I'm not saying that every time you have a child who's struggling with emotional control, you can infer that their parents must have trouble with emotional control as well. I don't want to make that, make that point because there's a temperament aspect to this. Kids are different from, every, every kid is unique. Um, but it is just something, just something to keep in mind. 
Um, for, for kids who really struggle with this, there are strategies that work, but nothing works fast. Um, probably the two that have the best research support for kids who really struggle with emotional control is um, cognitive behavior therapy, teaching kids to talk to themselves. So cognitive behavior therapy is basically based on the premise that your feelings are not caused by external events. They're caused by what you tell yourself about those external events. So if you can teach kids to reframe what they're telling themselves, they can reframe their emotions. So that's one. Um, the other strategy which I think can be very effective is mindfulness meditation techniques. Um, and again, you know, nothing works fast, but there, it's become much, mindfulness has become much more sort of prominent in, in our culture today anyway. And there are some really nice resources for parents. My, my favorite book is called Sitting Still, or for parents, is called Sitting Still Like a Frog. Uh, and it basically walks parents through guided meditations they can do with their kids. Um, it comes with a CD, so you don't have to do the meditation yourself, but it's a great, like, five minute cool down before you go to sleep kind of exercise with kids. Um, and again, the benefits accrue over time. But I'll just mention one other because this is the one I think we forget to do. Just start by acknowledging how the student feels or how the child feels. We forget to do that. And I realized that about a year and a half ago, or just before Christmas, a year ago, um, I was invited to do a presentation at a private school in North Carolina. Uh, and this mom of a middle school child came up to me after the presentation, and she said her daughter had ADHD, and she was just completely discouraged. And she kept saying things like, how come I'm so stupid? I am such a failure. And the mom said, and I keep telling her, you are not stupid. You are not a failure. At which point I said to the mom, how about you just acknowledge her frustration or how upset she is or how discouraged she feels? And the mom looked at me like I was nuts. You really think that helps? <laughs> if any of you have ever been in a situation where someone has zeroed in on what you're feeling, you know that having that feeling acknowledged and recognized actually helps you move beyond it. In fact, there's a lot of brain research to show that, and there's a, there's a researcher named Dan Siegel, who this is his area of expertise, and he talks, he has an expression, name it to tame it. So if you name the feeling, it doesn't have as much power over you. So, okay, let's go on to the next one, which is flexibility. So I mentioned that I got interested in executive skills by working with kids with ADHD, and kids with ADHD have all kinds of executive skill challenges. Flexibility is not necessarily a challenge for them. Very often it's a strength, right, because these are go-with-the-flow kinds of kids. But I'm sure you can think of kids who struggle with flexibility. You know, when I ask teachers, so what's a, what group of kids struggle with flexibility, the first answer I always get is kids on the autism spectrum. Um, it's almost like a critical, that rigid thinking is almost a critical feature of autism spectrum disorder. Um, but I think of flexibility as an executive skill that sort of lies beneath the surface. Uh, we see the behavior we may not realize it starts with inflexibility. So if you have trouble dealing with unexpected changes in plans, what happens when they occur? Your anxiety level rises. So what we see is the anxiety, but it started with inflexibility. I also think about kids with disruptive, oppositional, defiant uh, behavior. Um, and when I think about those kids, you know, I'm thinking about power struggles and control issues, and they're refusing to do what we've asked. But if you step back and say, what was the trigger? What led that kid to refuse to do what we've asked? Very often it was because someone was asking that child to be more flexible than they were capable of being. And all they had was their behavior as a way of saying, I can't do that. Um, the good news is flexibility can be taught, um, and there are some nice curricula out there designed to do that. One of my favorites is called Unstuck and On Target. It's a school-based curricula, curriculum, but the people who developed it have developed a lot of materials for parents as well. Um, so if you go to their website, Unstuck and On Target, you'll see um, um, resources for parents there as well. They've also written a book called Solving Executive Function Challenges uh, that I also really like. It's full of, it's a really thin book, it's a quick read, but it's full of scripts you know, for both parents and teachers. How can you talk to your inflexible child so that you're modeling flexibility, so that you're modeling how you deal with unexpected changes in plans or whatever? Um, okay, let's go on to the next one. 
which is sustained attention. Okay, so this one is a critical feature of an attention disorder. Um, there's a key phrase in my definition, though. The, key, the definition is the capacity to maintain attention to a situation or task. The key phrase is in spite of distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. And I've appreciated that phrase over the years because I don't know how many parents have been nudged into my office by a teacher or a pediatrician because someone thinks their kid has attention problems, and they will say to me, my kid can't have ADD. He can play video games for hours. <laughs> Well, video games don't involve distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. So what I tell parents is it's not that kids with ADD can't pay attention. It's that they have trouble making themselves pay attention. That's not going to happen with video games. Where are parents going to see it? Three places. Homework, chores, boring daily routines like teeth brushing or taking showers. Um, so. Keep that in mind as, as you're looking at, at your child and trying to figure out what's going on. There are a lot of, and I'll talk more about these with teachers tomorrow, there are a lot of strategies for helping kids with short attention spans. My general place to start, particularly with parents, is um, ask kids how long they think they can work before they need to take a break, whether it's a chore or homework or whatever. How long do you think you can work? Um, and what that does is it gets kids thinking about Hmm, how long is my attention span? So they're starting to think, you know, how long can they work rather than you saying, okay, do three math problems and then you can take a break. You may have to start with that, but eventually you want the kid to be able to say, hmm, how long can I work before I need a break? And then you try to stretch that out. So if the kid says, yeah, I can do three math problems before I need a break. So you go with that for a while. And then you say, you know, we've been doing three for a while. Can we increase to four? and you just incrementally increase the length of their attention span. Or going back to setting that kitchen timer. <laughs> Set the kitchen timer for bedroom cleaning for five minutes, go with that for a while, and then increase it to eight minutes. I mean, it really incrementally is probably the best way to do this. Uh, okay, task initiation is the next executive skill. Um, this is basically the opposite of procrastination. And I am firmly convinced this is the last and hardest skill to acquire. Um, and this is based on my own personal experience as well as my clinical experience from working with adults. This is a late developing skill. If you type the word procrastination into an academic search engine, you will be hit with over 5,000 citations. So people have done a lot of research about this, which tells you people recognize that this is a problem. I've read some of those articles, and I found one that gave me a developmental timeline for procrastination. And here's what it said. So remember, this is a, procrastination is a bad thing. Procrastination increases until the mid to late 20s and decreases gradually after that. Surveys of college students have shown that 86% of college students say that procrastination is a problem for them. And almost half of them say it affects their grades. And that was a study that came out before the pandemic. It got worse with the pandemic. Um, so when I saw that survey of college students, I thought, man, we have got to figure out how to teach task initiation. If we could figure that out, we could increase college graduation rates, we could decrease the amount of time parents, kids are spending in college and save parents thousands of dollars. Um, and so I began to think about how do you teach task initiation? And I came up with an idea, it won't work in all cases, but I use it very effectively um, with my own kids and I've had other parents use it with their kids. Here's how I think you teach task initiation. You teach kids to make a plan with a start time. And then you make sure they start the plan at the time they said they were going to start it. So as a parent, you could say to your kid on Saturday morning, what's your plan for cleaning up your bedroom? And the kid might say, oh, I'll do it right after lunch. Well, then your job as a parent is to be there right after lunch to make sure your kid starts cleaning his bedroom at the time he said he was going to clean it. Here's why this is important, because the brain learns by association. The more you pair two events or glue them together over and over again, then event A will trigger event B. It's a variation on Pavlov's dog. If you remember that famous psych experiment where the Russian psychologist rang a bell, presented meat to the dog, and the dog salivated when he saw the meat. Well, after a while, all the psychologist had to do was ring the bell and the dog salivated. Why? Because he anticipated that the meat was coming. So stated start time, actual start time. 
Okay, so these are the first six foundational skills. So again, this is where you this is where you focus. You've got elementary age kids, or if you've got kids who are really struggling with executive skills in general. Um, and as I said, these are the basic building blocks for the later skills. So this is why it's a good place to start. The other reason to start with these foundational skills is they lend themselves to easier interventions than the more advanced skills. You know, it's a whole lot easier to teach a kid to make a plan with a start time than to teach him to make a plan, which is the next executive skill. Planning is a way more complicated. Planning is, okay, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? What resources or materials do I need? When am I, how am I gonna get them? When am I gonna get them? Where am I gonna get them? Um, what are the steps I need to follow my plan? What's the logical order for those steps? What's important, what's not important? All of that goes into planning. Um, and when I think about planning in a school context, you know, I immediately think about long-term projects. <laughs> Uh, and I decided many years ago that there's a mismatch between when teachers start assigning long-term projects to kids and when they can realistically plan them themselves. And I think te most teachers understand that. So they do the planning for kids. They break the project down into subtasks and timelines and interim deadlines, and they walk kids through those projects, um, which I think is totally developmentally appropriate. However, it fails to take advantage of the opportunity to teach planning. Um, so my advice to teachers all the time is, and I think the same could be true with, par with parents, is plan with kids rather than for kids. So Saturday morning you may say to your, your kids, okay, we got some stuff we gotta do today. These are the errands and chores you gotta do. Here's the fun stuff we wanna do. Let's make a plan for how the day is gonna go. What do you think we should do first? Let's talk about how much time each thing may take and let's talk about what's a logical, what's a logical order. I mean, all of that. Um, you can do as well. Now, going back to long-term projects for a minute, because there's an additional issue here, especially as it relates to parents, is that typically when schools assign long-term projects to kids, the expectation is that kids are gonna do them at home. And that ends up putting a lot of pressure on parents to supervise those, those long-term projects. Uh, and so someone found a picture on Facebook many years ago um, which really captures the problem nicely. I'm gonna show it to you. It's a science project. Did we all have science projects when we were young? But the topic of this science project is, how much turmoil does the science project cause families? <laughs> and it's set up the way a science project is. So on the left-hand side, you have the materials, at least one kid, at least one grudging parent, half-baked ideas of very dubious merit and procrastination. And then you have the results section in the, in the middle. You have this nice graph showing yelling and crying on one axis and time on the other axis. And the closer the due date, the more yelling and crying is going, occurring. You've got quantitative results. 75% of kids cry. 90% of parents yell. An average of 15 hours of family time is sacrificed. Findings. Everyone hates the science fair. <laughs> so I think that sort of captures it really nicely. Um, OK, let's move on to organization. There's a key word in my definition here. The definition is the ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information or materials. You know, sometimes I'll ask an audience, so what's the key word? When I ask um, audiences of educators, you know, sometimes they say abilities, sometimes they say create, sometimes they say systems, but this is my weakest skill. And my response to that is I am great at creating systems of organization. Every four weeks, I have to come up with another system for keeping my schedule clean, because the last one didn't work. It's obvious that maintain is the key word here, right? Um, keeping up a system over time. And if you have ever tried to turn a disorganized kid into an organized kid, you know this is a long-term labor-intensive process. It's not just a question of creating a system and handing it off to the kid and expecting him to run with it. Um, or even better, because everybody's organizational system is somewhat unique to them, of saying to the kid, you know what, your backpack's a mess. You can't find your homework when you need to do it, and you can't find it when you need to hand it in. So let's take your backpack apart and figure out a system that will work for you so that you can find the stuff that you need to find easily without too much you know, stress or time. But you still, so you do that, but you still can't hand it off to the kid and expect them to run with it. And I finally figured out why that is. It's because at any single point in time, it is faster not to use an organizational system than to use an organizational system, right? It's way faster to take that science worksheet and stuff it in the backpack wherever 
than it is to take out the science notebook, open that up, take out the incomplete homework folder, open that up, put the homework neatly in, put it all neatly back in your backpack. Yeah, it may take longer in the long run, but in the moment, it's faster not to do that. And for people who are organizationally challenged, and I include myself in this, you know, we're looking to cut corners to do things as fast as possible. We don't want to be bothered. Um, okay, now there's one other thing that I've noticed with, with this, uh, and that is, well, there are several other things, but I'll just share one of them, um, that parents and kids often have different executive skills profiles. You know, in part because these skills take 25 years to reach full maturation, but also because kids are inher in their genetics is coming from two parents. And sometimes it gets mixed in and there's a third generation back there that had this, so you never know what you're getting. Um, and so what, you, what I find is that when parents and kids' executive profiles differ, that can sometimes cause issues. And one of the worst combinations I've come up with, I've found, one of the biggest challenges is when you have a highly organized parent with a slob of a kid because it is really hard for that organized parent to let that go. It is really hard for them just to close the bedroom door and say, okay, I'm not going to look at it. Or, yeah, maybe once a month we'll try to clean your bedroom. So, and so I'm always, basically what I'm saying to those organized parents, keep it simple. You know, don't don't start with expecting your kid to clean his entire bedroom perfectly so that he would meet your standards. Um, have him be responsible as a starting point for one piece of his bedroom, and then you and he or she do the rest of it together um, as one option. Or I had a mom who told me she divided their bedroom, and she took masking tape and divided the bedroom into a th nine squares, so nine quadrants. And she said, okay, that one's yours. I'll do these. <laughs> and then she gradually increased the number of squares her daughter was responsible for. So that's a way to shape that kind of skill in kids who really don't have it. OK, on to time management. So now we're going to see the earlier developing skills embedded in these later developing skills. Because time management is basically task initiation, sustained attention, and planning. With one additional element that's unique to time management, and that is time estimation. The ability to estimate how long it takes to do something. Um, and in my experience, working with people with poor time management skills, it's the time estimation piece that doesn't work real well. Um, and when I'm working with kids, what I find is more often than not, they underestimate how long an effortful task is going to take. And then they leave it to the last minute, and they run out of time, they blow a deadline, or they pull an all-nighter. I do, though, see a subset of kids who do the opposite. They overestimate how long a task is going to take, and then they don't want to start it, because in their mind, it's going to take forever. In either way, either way, the solution is the same, teach time estimation. And the nice thing is, anything is fodder for this. You know, how long do you think it'll take you to make your bed? How long do you think it'll take you to get dressed? How long do you think it will take you to do this math homework? You know, anything, and just have kids guess and then track it and compare their guess to the actual, and over time, they will learn to calibrate time. Okay, let's go on to the next one, which is goal-directed persistence. So this is a very late developing skill, um, especially as the way we think about it. I mean, you can see goal-directed persistence in a preschooler. You know, a four-year-old is putting a really challenging puzzle together, and they are not going to stop until they get that puzzle completely right. That's what goal-directed persistence looks like at that age. Um, but we're talking about longer-term goals. We're not talking about things you can accomplish by lunchtime. Um, and with that in mind, now you'll see how all the other executive skills factor in here. Because you can't just set a goal and forget about it. You have to remember it. So there's working memory. You have to have a plan for achieving the goal. So there's planning. You have to start and finish the plan. So there's task initiation and sustained attention. You have to resist the temptation to do all those other fun things you'd rather be doing than working on your goal. So there's response inhibition. And if that's irritating or annoying to you, then you also have to manage your emotions. So you could find a place for almost every executive skill I've already talked about in goal-directed persistence. This, by the way, is the killer skill for middle school parents. You know, my experience, middle school parents expect their kids to have goal-directed persistence by that age, and most of the middle schoolers I've run across don't have it. They're not there yet. It makes perfect sense why that is. So a parent will say to me, 
doesn't my kid realize how he's doing in eighth grade is gonna affect what college he gets into in four years? <laughs> and the short answer to that is no. <laughs> they don't have that kind of time horizon. They haven't lived long enough. They can't picture four years out. And they probably can't picture either college either because they've never seen it. So you're asking them to picture a time span that they can't conceptualize and a, a goal at the end of that that they have no idea what that looks like. Um, so I, as I say, I'm, I'm always preaching patience to parents of, of middle school kids around goal-directed persistence. And I think the typical mistake that parents make at this age, and I made it when my kids were in middle school, is they look at goal-directed persistence through this very narrow window called academic performance. So I was leaning on my kids to, can you make the honor roll? Can you bring your grade up in math? They weren't there yet. That was not important to them. So start by focusing on something that is important to the kid and supporting them in achieving their personal goal. You know, if they're into sports, it could be a sports goal. You know, something that many teenagers want, two things that many teenagers want that require goal-directed persistence. They want a driver's license, they want a job. You know, both of those things require goal-directed persistence. With younger kids, one of my favorite ways to support this skill is by having a child save up, something, save up for something that costs more than their weekly allowance. Because then you can talk with them about how are you going to earn the money? How are you going to save the money? How are you going to resist the temptation to spend smaller amounts of money on something less expensive and blow the opportunity to buy that thing you really want? So that you can build a lot of goal-directed persistence into something like that. Um, and then finally, metacognition. So we're back to this again. It's the ability to see the big picture. Um, you know, I gave you one definition before. It, it, it's the ability to connect the dots, to put the pieces of the puzzle together. It's hard to talk about metacognition without using a metaphor, which is apt because meta is the same in both. If I were going to use psychological terms, I would talk about self-awareness, self-evaluation, self-monitoring. It's this little voice in your head that's saying, okay, Am I on track to finish my homework by the time, by bedtime? Um, did I remember to put my math book in my backpack? Uh, have I checked the rubric to make sure I've got all the things in the, in the project that the teacher wants me to have? Or when you get a test back and it's not the grade you want, you said, hmm, what, what did I do? What can I do differently the next time to bring my grade up? So all of that is there. It's, the, it's also the skill that underlies abstract thinking. Um, so again, before it develops, kids have trouble thinking abstractly. And it's the skill that enables you to, to read the room. To, so there's a social aspect to metacognition as well. So you see, it begins to develop in typical kids maybe around age 11, maybe around fifth grade. It's a very slow developing skill. But it's become so prominent during the middle school years um, and, and so think about what that's like from a social perspective. Now you're aware that you have thoughts. And as you're aware that you have thoughts, then it occurs to you, oh, everybody else has thoughts too. And because teenagers are self-absorbed and they're thinking about themselves all the time, then you make this assumption that everybody else out there is thinking about them too. So it helps explain that extreme self-consciousness that goes along with early adolescence where you suddenly realize, oh, that person has thoughts. I bet they're thinking about me. I bet they're thinking bad things about me. Um, so all of that is, is part of metacognition. So we talk about using reflection as a way to encourage metacognition. Unfortunately, what we often do with that is we debrief with kids after things go wrong. <laughs> uh, so we say to them, Ugh, you got sent in from recess again. So what went wrong, and what can you do differently the next time so that you don't get sent in from recess again? We forget to then say to the kid, wow, you went three whole days without getting sent in from recess. Great job. What strategies were you using? So that's why encourage self-reflection following successes. Um, and actually, if you pair it with, so what strategy were you using? The kid may not have felt that they had a strategy, but you may be able to delineate, so here's the strategy you were using. You were telling yourself, okay, I'm not gonna throw the kid off the swing because I wanna swing now. <laughs> I'm gonna wait my turn, you know, whatever it is. You can help illuminate whatever strategies kids are using, and you can use that kind of self-talk, which they may not be even aware that they're doing, to help them understand 
Um, but again, start with successes. Um, okay, so here's, here's where I think this is important. The words we use to describe these kids is important. Um, and I am a huge advocate of sharing all this information and knowledge with kids themselves, to talk with kids about task initiation and talk about how procrastination might get in the way of them getting their homework started, to talk with kids about emotional control and learning to manage their emotions. Because in the absence of using this terminology, we may be using other words which are not helpful. So this is a kid, I saw him twice. He was seven the first time I saw him. He was one of the most hyperactive, impulsive kids I'd seen at that point in my clinical practice. Um, he also had Tourette's syndrome, could not take stimulant medications because they exacerbated his tics. Uh, he managed to get through from elementary school, he get through elementary and middle school successfully. He had a couple of things going for him. First of all, although he had huge attention problems, he did not have a learning disability. He was a smart kid. Second of all, he had a mom who stayed on top of him, a mom who made sure he did his homework, a mom who made sure he put it in his backpack, a mom who kept in close contact with the teacher so she knew what the expectations were and made sure he did the work he was supposed to get done. And then he hit high school, and he basically crashed and burned. Um, and Because if you think about these kids with a mom who's sort of micromanaging the kid, by the time they hit high school, it becomes a moving target. Uh, because the, the, the mom's relying on the kid for information because she can't check in with every single teacher the kid has. So if the kid comes home and says, oh, no, no homework and math tonight, how does the mom know? Or, yeah, I handed in my English paper. How does the mom know? Or, well, the, she, ta she changed the test date. It's not tomorrow. It's not till next week. How does the mom know? So this kid had failed two classes after his freshman year, during his freshman year in high school. His, he was in summer school making up those classes. He had Ds in two other classes. He actually had one A. It was in a class called ROTC. It's the only high school I know of in New Hampshire that offered an ROTC program, which was perfect for him. He wanted to join the military. That was his long-term goal. And if you think about what an ROTC class must be like, it's probably both structured and regimented and active and outdoors. So for a kid with attention problems, it would be perfect. So he aced that class. But his mom called me at the end of his freshman year, and she said, I can't do it by myself anymore. I'm going to need help from the school. Um, I'm going to lose him before he graduates from high school. So she asked me to do an evaluation to provide documentation to support the need for getting additional services for him. Interestingly enough, um, it, I didn't have any trouble doing that. He had ADHD, and he failed two classes. That looks like a disability to me. We got him a coach. Um, and. Basically, his school had an e-block at the end of the day that kids could use for a study hall or checking in with teachers to get extra help or for credit recovery. So four, four days, uh, four afternoons during e-block, he and the coach got together. The coach helped him make plans for how he was going to do his homework. On Thursday, the mom came in, and the three of them sat down together and made plans for the weekend. You know, I called him back a year later to find out how he was doing. His sophomore year, he had two Cs, two Bs, and an A in ROTC again, so that made a difference. Um, but as part of my evaluation, I asked the mom to find one teacher who knew the kid well to fill out a rating scale on him, and this, or several rating scales. This is a piece of one of them. Uh, and so here's what this teacher said. What, can, what uh, concerns you most about this pupil? That he's lazy and not working to his potential. Please describe the best things about this pupil. He's sweet and has a good sense of humor which describes just about every kid with ADHD or ADD that I've ever worked with, including my own son. Um, but I'm, I'm just calling your attention to the negative terms that we use to describe this kid. Lazy, not working to potential. Those look like character flaws to me. Those look like something that kids feel like they have no control over. Um, and so my, my plea um, for those of you here, and I may be teaching, preaching to the choir, because my guess is you have some understanding of this whole domain having come here tonight, but my plea is that instead of calling students this, lazy, unmotivated, not working to potential, disruptive, oppositional, messy, tardy, forgetful, absent-minded, or lacking a work ethic, and all of those are terms I've had either parents or teachers or both use to describe the kids that I've worked with, how about we describe them as having challenges in task initiation, sustained attention, response inhibition? 
All those terms on the left-hand side feel like dead ends to me. The terms on the right-hand side bring you to problem solving. So what are we going to do about it? So again, you guys may not do this yourself, but some of you may have relatives. Or some of you may actually, your kids have had teachers who've used these terms with you. So uh, all I can suggest is if, if someone says to you, man, your kid is lazy, then if you just politely say, you know what? I prefer to think of it as having challenges with task initiation and sustained attention. And we're going to solve this problem. We're going to figure it out. Um, OK, so what do we do about this? How do we help these kids? Um, there are three primary ways that parents and teachers can help kids with weak executive skills. Uh, the first is they can change the environment to reduce the impact of weak executive skills. So we're not trying to, to um, change the child at this point. We're just trying to create an environment that's more supportive or less punishing. So if your child consistently forgets to bring his homework to school or something like that, then you're putting in place a, a cue prompt or reminder to help them remember to do that, or putting in place a routine. You're not trying to improve, change the kid. You're trying to put in place uh, something supportive to make it easier for him to, to actually put his homework in his backpack. Or we can teach the youngster the executive skill that they're missing. Or the third option is, maybe they have that executive skill, but in its early stages, it's pretty effortful, it's pretty laborious, it's pretty painful. But if you throw an incentive on top of that, you may be able to entice the kid to do the practice he needs to do to get better at that skill. So you offer a reward of some kind. Um, so let me give you, um, let me flesh out uh, some of these, uh, and then we'll move on to, to a Q&A. How do you modify the environment? You can change the physical or social environment. You can modify the tasks we expect kids to perform, or we can change the way adults interact with kids. So here are some examples of environmental modifications. Managing distractions, giving kids a quiet place to do homework, or a neat place to do homework, or ha maybe having them not do their homework in their bedroom because there are too many distractions, and bedroom is a cue for either having fun playing or sleeping, which has nothing to do with homework. Um, modifying tasks, shortening them, building in breaks, creating a schedule that you just follow that schedule every day, or building in choice. A lot of parents will say to me, okay, so I tell my kid, math is as hard a subject, so do the math first, get it over with, because you have more energy at the beginning of doing homework, which makes a whole lot of sense. That's how I would approach the, my to-do list. The problem is that's t totally taking choice away from kids. Um, and so I would prefer, when you're making a homework plan with kids, put it on their shoulders first. So what are you going to do first? What are you going to do second? And if the kid routinely leaves math to last and he, he can't finish it or he makes lots of mistakes, then you, now you've got data. You can say, okay, for the last two weeks, you've been holding off math until the very end. And it looks like you're having trouble getting it done. So could we try mixing it up a bit? Could we try doing math first for the next few days and see how that goes? Um, but you start by giving kids choice. Um, giving advance warning when something changes. This is for kids who struggle with emotional control or flexibility. Um, because the, the hardest part for them is when they have an expectation about how things are going to go. And it doesn't go the way they expected it to. Um, using visual cues rather than verbal nags. I'm going to share, I talked about this before for working memory. I'm going to share my favorite example of this because it was given to me, shared with me by a mother who came. To, I did a presentation like this a few years ago, actually, February 2019, in, um, in uh, Gorham, Maine, out, uh, a pretty affluent suburb of uh, uh, Portland, Maine. And this mom had told me, OK, so my kid keeps forgetting what, day, what he has each day because he's on block scheduling and he has A days and B days. So I created this giant calendar for him. And I said, can you send me a picture? So she did. So you can get those, you know, giant whiteboard calendar. She sets it up for him each month. She's got a, she lists each day what subjects he has. She's got it color coded. So if, um, if homework is in email, that's red. If it's a backpack, that's green. Uh, Google Classroom's a different color. She's working off of three different school schedules. She's got eight different dry erase markers there that she's using. So my guess is you know what executive skills she's good at, right? <laughs> Probably both planning and organization. She posted this in a prominent place, so the kid couldn't miss it. But if you're worried the kid, it'd be it's sort of uh, 
falls into the background after a while, you can say to the kid before leaving the morning, hey, read me today's schedule so that you know they've at least read the classes they have. Um, and you can review with them, okay, which one of those classes do you have homework you have to hand in? Um, okay. Changing the way we talk with kids. Um, using praise effectively um, is probably one of the most powerful ways you can influence kids' behavior. Uh, and we've got years and years of research to this. In fact, they, every once in a while, they, they gather all the research together and try to figure out, OK, what's, let's summarize what this research says. It's a process It's called a meta-analysis, where they look at all the studies and analyze all the studies. And the last one I read on, on the use of effective praise said, if you can achieve a ratio of three positives for each piece of corrective feedback you give a kid, that alone can change behavior which sounds perfect, right? Takes 10 seconds and costs nothing. <laughs> the problem, there are two problems with it. One is, it's hard to remember to do that. But the other thing is, there's effective praise and there's ineffective praise, and it's a whole lot easier to use ineffective praise. It's a whole lot easier to say, nice job, good work, smart kid, than it is to say, I appreciate you loading the dishwasher without my having to bug you about it. But what that does is it's effective praise is specific. So it lets the kid ex know exactly what it is that you think is praiseworthy. And in fact, with that one statement, you're praising two things. You're praising the kid for loading the dishwasher and for not having to be reminded to do it. Um, your brother was pushing your buttons, but you worked hard to keep your temper in check. You know, I like that one because maybe the kid ultimately loses his temper and hits his brother. But what you saw was he was trying hard not to do that, and that's what you're reinforcing. And maybe the next time he'll try a little harder, and maybe the time after that he'll actually succeed in controlling his temper. Um, I like the way you thought about that and figured out a good solution to the problem. Anytime we can reinforce problem solving, that one can generalize into all kinds of situations, social problems, academic problems. Um, you know, problems dealing with siblings, I mean, all of those. I like the way you thought about that and figured out a solution to the problem. Okay, so let's talk about teaching the skill. Um, and I've got a, a formula for that. And this is basically, it, chapter 10 in Smart But Scatter, if you have this book, this basically follows this formula. So whenever possible, whatever skill you're trying to reinforce, you embed it in a daily routine the kid has to do anyway. You list the steps in the routine. You walk the child through the steps repeatedly. You create a visual that outlines the routine. And then you fade the prompts by having the child use the visual. They, you don't need to be in the bedroom anymore if you've given them a bedroom cleaning checklist. And in fact, that's a good example. <laughs> this is what a bedroom cleaning checklist might look like. This was actually created by an occupational therapist who worked at a school in Vermont for kids with dyslexia. So it was a residential school. Um, and the school decided they had to tackle the bedrooms because um, parents would come visit the school. They'd take one look at the, the dorms and they'd say, oh, we're not sending our kid here. These bedrooms are a mess. So I was working with them over the summer. So the, the, the dorm parents or whatever decided, okay, this is what we're going to do. When kids come back to school for the next school year, we're going to make sure they put everything away in their bedroom. Uh, and then we're going to take a picture of it while it looks clean. And then we're going to create a checklist. So here's what I like, like about this is that there are 10 things on this checklist, which for someone like me who's organizationally challenged, that's pretty daunting. They've broken it down into four pieces. My clean desk, my clean shelves, my clean bed, my clean floor. So you can, the kid can do one, one quadrant at a time. Um, and in fact, this school, what they decided to do was they had an hour built in between the last study hall in the afternoon and dinner. And one of the things they expected kids to do during that hour was to tidy their bedrooms. If you do it every day, it's not a big job. Um, so that's one, as you can see, it, it satisfies every, my list of, of how, you, how you teach a skill. Um, the other thing, you know, whenever you can embed multiple different executive skills into one um, routine, then you're, you're killing multiple birds with one stone. And so you can probably figure out how this does that. But here's another example of that. Teaching kids to make study plans. So this is, um, this is not where kids write down the homework. They, I mean, they're either finding it online or they're writing in their assignment book. But this is where they're making a plan. It's like an expanded to-do list. So they're listing their homework assignments. 
you know, math, science, English. And for each one, you're, you're asking them to estimate how long they think that task will take. So what are we working on there? Time management, time estimation. And then in the next column, we ask them, so when are you gonna start? What's that? That's task initiation. That's the plan with the start time. Where will you work? That's an interesting one because we put that column in after reading all the research on mental rehearsal and visual imagery. Because what that research shows is if you mentally rehearse carrying out a task, it increases both the likelihood that you carry out the task and actually makes it easier to carry out the task because you've rehearsed it in your mind first, especially if you use vivid visual imagery. Now, we've sort of streamlined it, so we just ask kids to identify where they're going to work. But if you think about it, that's part of the plan, too. So once they've filled those four questions out, you have now have the tasks they have to do. You have, you, they've estimated, so let's say math. Um, they estimate it's going to take 20 minutes. They're going to start at 5 o'clock. They're going to work in the kitchen. So they have this nice little package of math at a certain time for a certain duration in a certain place. Uh, and then if you ask them to make, actually write down the start and stop times, now that's a check on two things. Did they start when they said they were going to start? And did it, were they right with their time estimate? So when kids get home from school, we know kids need downtime. It's, it's the rare kid who is willing to do their homework as soon as they get home from school because they've been in school all day. They need break. They need a break. They need to get out and run around. They need downtime. They need to do something fun or relaxing. But before they do that, have them make a plan like this. It won't take more than five minutes, which goes back to my five-minute rule, the routine that, you, that takes no more than five minutes and that you're willing to do forever or as long as it takes. Okay. So as a variation on that, here's my second formula. Go back to Formula Rum and collaborate with your child. Rather than setting up the routine and walking the kid through it, now you and the kid together identify the problem situation. Now you and the kid together come up with the steps in the routine. So you could say to a kid, you know what? I, I'm sorry, your bedroom is driving me crazy. Let's think about how to clean it up. What do you think we need to do first? Let's make a plan for cleaning the bedroom. You create a checklist, you agree on a start time. So that's another way to get at that. All right, let me talk briefly about incentives, then I'll sort of wrap it up with some final thoughts. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on incentives. I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, parents have very different feelings about incentives. You know, and there's a lot of parents out there who don't believe in rewarding their kids. <laughs> um, very often, I, sometimes I get this question from a parent, and I can tell where they're coming from. They'll say to me, so what do you think about paying my kid for getting A's on the report card? <laughs> and just by the way they're asking, I can see, you know, they don't want to reward a kid for something they should want to do anyway. Um, I'm pretty pragmatic about this because, first of all, incentives make both the effort of learning a skill and the effort of a performing a task less aversive. If there's a reward at the end, it's a whole lot easier to get the energy to do it. Um, and then, furthermore, if you're putting an incentive after a task, it teaches delayed gratification. It's teaching kids to wait. Not only that, they have to work to wait. They have to work and wait. Um, so, again, you know, you don't want to go overboard, and again, questions may come up at the end about the use of incentives, and why don't we, why don't we hold those? Um, I have to say, though, and I've created very elaborate incentive systems, both for my own kids and in my clinical practice, where I have kids earning points. The points can be traded in for something big like a smartphone, that kind of thing. I've done it, I've done it effectively. Whenever possible, though, I rely on simple incentives. One of my favorites, I use this with myself all the time. <coughs> Giving the child something to look forward to doing when the effortful task is done. You know, as soon as I finish that psych report, I get to go for a walk and listen to my favorite book on tape. You know, I use that as an incentive all the time for myself. Um, kids can do it too. Ask them what's something really fun you want to do that you can do as soon as you get that math homework done. Um, alternate between preferred and non-preferred activities. First work, then play, we often say. Uh, build in frequent short breaks, and depending on the child and their attention span, you may, they may need to be very frequent. Um, and they may need to, so it could be as frequently as every 10 minutes, and the break could last five minutes. That's where you start um, in using specific praise wherever we can. Okay, so let me wrap this up with my sort of key strategies. I'm just going to repeat what I think, think are the sort of, uh, as I say here, the biggest bang for the buck. Keeping tasks and chores brief for building and breaks so kids can get through them. Giving your child something to look forward to doing. 
building in choice whenever possible, using lists and checklists as reminders, building in routines. Whenever you build in a routine, you're de think about brushing your teeth at night. You don't even think about it anymore, right? Because you just have built up years and years of knowing that before you go to bed, you brush your teeth. Um, so a routine um, decreases the amount of effort you have to put into it, because it just sort of happens automatically. Um, Ask children to reflect on their own performance, especially when they're successful. What worked for you today? Why do you think it worked? Use questions to get them to use their executive skills. What's your plan? Do you have a strategy for that? Um, I have three grandchildren. My oldest granddaughter, who's now 10, um, probably around a year to 15 months old, I realized, oh, she's pretty inflexible, <laughs> which she got from her grandmother. Um, and her mom, my son's wife, was great at dealing with her. She would say, okay, Violet, let's make a plan. I know you wanted to do that now, but you know what? We can't until after lunch because I have some stuff I have to do first. So let's make a plan. Or unfortunately, we can't do that today because it's raining out. So let's make a plan for something else we could do. Um, this is the one I can never say without, with a straight face. When problems arise, share your observations in a non-judgmental way. I noticed you. What do you think we can do about that? I say that because I couldn't pull this off when my kids were teenagers. If you're able to do that, more power to you. Because what we know about teenagers is they, when, when there is emotion coming at them, their emotion goes through the roof. That happens more with teenagers than any other ages because what's going on in the limbic system and the fact that, which is where emotions reside and the fact that the frontal lobes haven't totally gotten control over that. So if you can keep your voice level down, if you can keep um, your own emotions in check, you might be able to come up with a more reasonable solution than if you're trying, I know you'll come up with a more reasonable solution if you're trying to, to es if you're both escalating. Brainstorm strategies, make a list of possible strategies, ask the child to pick one, and then make a game plan for trying it out. Um, keep your eye on the prize, um, building, which I think is building goal-directed persistence. Um, model it yourself. I feel like that was the most powerful strategy I had available to me when my kids were in middle school. They had no goal-directed persistence at all, as far as I could see, with the possible exception of playing video games. Um, and I just kept telling myself, they have two parents with tremendous goal-directed persistence. When they find their passion, they will channel that. And that's exactly what happened. Happened at different times with both my kids. My younger son, who did not have an attention disorder, somehow, somewhere in high school, I could see it was kicking in. My older son, the one with the attention disorder, is probably around age 25. Um, but at any rate, I really think that that can be very powerful. Um, help them set their own goals and little ones to start with. Praise effort. Wow, you stuck with it. You figured it out. I can't believe how hard you worked for that. And then emphasize your child's goals, not yours. And then finally, be patient. Your child at 15 will not look the same as when they're 25. I'm going to use two pictures here of my own son. He's given me permission to do this. Not my ADD kid. It was my other kid. <laughs> so this was Isaac when he was 15. Yeah. That's what he looked like then. I mean, his, and he went through multiple hair, hairstyles, that, all of which I found appalling. <laughs> this was him 10 years later. Actually, he looked like that four years later. He got a job right out of high school. He developed amazing computer skills in high school, entered the workforce at a time where you didn't have to go to college to get it. He got a job in cybersecurity. He was wearing suits, like by the time he was 19, he looked like that. If someone had said when he was 15, oh, here's what your son will look like in four years, I said, dream on. Um, so, uh, and then, do these strategies work? I just want to give you a couple of quotes. The first one was from a mom. I did a uh, workshop in uh, Ontario, Canada, a few years ago, and the mom wrote me afterwards. She said, I already used some of the tips you offered regarding emotional control of my daughter last night as we worked on her language assignment. We set the timer, took breaks, got a drink of water, and when she really started to freak out, I asked her to make a plan and thought of your daughter-in-law and smiled. Estimating how long it will take for, to do the assignment and then doing it in less time than she thought made my daughter feel so proud. When it was all done, I praised her ability to self-regulate and her effort to stick with it, even when it wasn't going the way she wanted, especially when I, too, wanted to freak out, yell and quit, smile. Um, and then the other is a quote from, it's a mom, it's a teacher I did some work with in Connecticut, but she was writing about her daughter. She sent me this email, middle school daughter. 
just tonight, my daughter needed help on an assignment. When she showed it to me, it was obvious she knew how to do it. She just didn't like it, thought it would take too long, wasn't sure how to get started. Thank goodness, because I know way more about breaking down assignments than I do about the agricultural revolution, which was apparently what the assignment was. I gave her a couple of strategies. Work for 20 minutes, then take a break. Do what you know and skip the hard parts. About 15 minutes later, she was done with all her work. Sometimes the strategies seem like stating the obvious, but they are powerful in their simplicity. And then one final quote, which really sort of captures my philosophy, and it's from um, the literature on restorative practice, restorative justice, which I got to from working with, actually, Ingrid's the school principal in this school that Ingrid worked in in um, Connecticut, who they were using it as a conflict mediation and discipline process. And I said, I need to know more about this. So they sent me to a website. This quote really captures my philosophy um, about working with kids. Human beings are happier, more cooperative, and more and productive, and more likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. You know, I'm thinking about there are times when our kids are annoying us so much we just want to do something to them. And there are other times where we realize, oh man, it would be so much faster if I did it, so we want to do things for them because it's faster. But doing them with them, that's the long-term strategy. Okay, we're gonna move on to Q&A, and uh, so maybe we, we'll stop the recording now in case people feel more comfortable raising questions or making comments. You can't see this, but I love this. It's an old New Yorker cartoon called The Big Book of Parent-Child Fights, and the first chapter is Food Arguments, and it starts on page one, and the last chapter is Miscellaneous Battles, and it's, it's on page 900, 505, <laughs> 9,505, which I think is what it feels like um, very often. Okay, and as a, feel free to raise any question, and if you want to argue with me, that's fine too. Um, um, and I, I assure you, because I, I, I work with audiences a lot, anytime anybody raises their hand with a question, there are probably 10 other people in this room had the same question, they just didn't raise their hand. Um, so, anybody want to get the ball started here?